All right, everybody, and welcome to another day of New Japan Pro Wrestling G1 Climax action. We've got a couple of young lions taking on Zack Sabre Jr. and El Desperado, Umino and Narita are these two, and honestly, I do not know who's who at this point. And we're starting off with one of them going up against the Whippet. Doing some chain wrestling here. Pretty much par for the course with Zack Sabre Jr. at a match. We are on day eight here. Had to skip a couple of days trying to get caught back up. Fortunately, there weren't any really interesting matches on either of those days. I'd say we had... Uh, Oh, Ishii versus Yoshihashi wasn't too bad. They certainly tore into each other. Fale going up against Zack Sabre Jr. was kind of interesting. Seemed a bit abbreviated. The finish was a bit cheap, I thought. Other than that, the only real important stuff. Elgin picked up a win against Kojima. Other than that, nothing really important. Toriano versus Omega was kind of funny. Body slam from the young lion there, not too bad. I was updating my notes, that's why I went quiet. Alrighty. That and honestly, there's not a whole lot to talk about during this match, I don't think. Although... Old Whippet is getting a little bit battered. Two, only to go. And if you're not sure where to sync up at this point, he's just trying for a Boston Crab, the young lion. Bud got rolled over, hooked, one, two, only to go. Saber using that uh, kick to the arm he likes to employ. Desperado coming in. Gonna keep working on the arm. And 
get stopped. Kick, jump, kick, drop kick, jumping drop kick. Makes the tag, bringing in the other guy. Sends Saber flying. Gonna do a double, a little double team action on El Desperado. There's a, an elbow and forearm, or couldn't quite tell what they did, what he did. Take him down, one, two, only two count. And the reason I don't know who these guys are yet is because I th they're both really new. Spinebuster, two, only to go. Looking for a stretch muffler, he has it. Very painful maneuver. Getting a lot of torque and adding in an arm bar there of sorts, and he gets a tap out. Stretch Muffler, one of those moves deceptively simple, excruciatingly painful. Especially if you can get the ankle hooked as well, because then you're putting a ton of pressure on the knee joint, the hip joint. You got the ankle picked, putting a lot of pressure on the ankle, forcing the guy's own weight to drag down and pull at those tendons and the joints and everything. So this guy I don't recognize at all. This might be Narita. And the other one, Amino. Have to wait and see. Desperado and Saber get the win, unsurprisingly. Whichever one he is, that young lion right there has a bit of attitude. Could serve him well. Wouldn't try that shit with Suzuki, though. It's one of the things I both like and dislike about Suzuki is you're never quite sure if he's legitimately or playing up to how crazy he is. Because I could easily see him actually flying off and hurting someone. Or maybe he's just that damn good at presenting himself in that fashion. Either way, I wouldn't want to piss him off. Alright, so we got Yuji Nagata. It's going to be Nagata and Kawato taking on Makabe and Taguchi. And Kawato already out there. Nagata not doing so great in the tournament. He's actually dropped uh, 0 and 4. He has four matches and not a single win so far. We already knew coming into it that this was going to be his last year in the tournament. He's had 19. That's a pretty damn good run. And we got Makabe coming out. His music gets muted because of copyright issues. I, I don't know why they don't just get him some new music. I mean, I can understand that he's been using this for a long time, probably, but... 
you know, I think Makabe still could have a good run in him, even maybe if not world champ, he definitely has a singles or certainly tag title run left in him. He's not as old as Nagata or Kojima or some of those guys, I don't think. So maybe changing things up a bit, getting some new music. Maybe a bit of a new look, change up his style a little bit. He definitely doesn't have any issues of being in shape. He doesn't gas out very easily, so... You know, maybe a little bit of a makeover for Makabe could be a good thing. And I'm betting we're going to get a good match out of these two on the next uh, show. They certainly know each other well enough. They got a nice roll through. Trying to get risk control. And if you're new to my commentaries, you'll find that I'll do a mixture of uh, fairly normal wrestling commentary mixed with some critique discussing the wrestlers from both a commentary, K, you know, KFAB and smarking, smarker, smarking off point of view. I am an unrepentant smark. We've got Nagata and Makabe off in the corner. Taguchi tags himself in. Makabe gives not one fuck. Taguchi trying to get him to tag out. Be tagged out. Nagata gonna tag in the young lion. Nellon Taguchi with some forearms. Nice arm drag. And Taguchi fakes him out, sends him flying. Well, he sends himself flying. <laughs> Off the ropes, and nails him with a funky weapon. That being his butt. even though they call it a hip attack. And gets him again. And again. And again. One, two, only two count. Gonna bring in Makabe. I don't know if we're gonna see Makabe join into Gucci's fun. Nope, he's gonna pick him up and slam him. Send Nagata flying. Again, nothing surprising there. And just kind of messing with the young lion there. Unfortunately, you've got somebody who very much gonna be a Junior heavyweight, but that was one hell of a drop kick. I'd say he got height on that to rival Okada and even Lance Storm. I know Lance Storm is retired, but I would love to see him come out of retirement, work New Japan for a while, just to see him and Okada have a drop kick off. If you don't know what I'm talking about, of course, we got Oka uh, Makabe and Nagata smashing away at each other here, but uh, Lance Storm, uh, back in the day, and he, maybe he can't do it anymore, but 
He used to be able to jump up from the mat all the way to the top turnbuckle in one clean motion and then springboard off it. Had one of, one of, if not the highest vertical leaps of anybody in pro wrestling. Makabe caught in the exploder, sometimes called a bulldog suplex here in the States. Technically the bulldog suplex has a slightly different setup and is a not quite as quick. Taguchi coming in, goes back to the hip attack. A little bit of taunting. I think he's all he's gonna do here is piss off Nagata. And I think he's gonna pay for it. Yeah, and he does. Shin kick right to the bottom. Uh, Nagata goes out. Young Lion comes in. And let me get my cheat sheet here. Kawato. Springboard. Nice missile drop kick. One, two. I think Kawato might be one of the most senior of the current crop of Young Lions. They're letting him do some of the more difficult stuff. Usually you can tell how long they are in the program by the... not necessarily the complexity or difficulty level of the moves they're doing, but the danger level, both to themselves and their opponents. Makabe stomping the crap out of him. Nagata comes in, sends Makabe out. Landed a couple of nice kicks, but gets caught. Taguchi likes to use that ankle pick. Ankle lock sends Taguchi flying. Nice counter. I think uh, when this guy, it's a two count, gets caught again. I think when uh, Kawato goes on his excursion, he really should uh, spend some time in England. And he has to tap. Taguchi really locking the ankle lock in there. Nagata Makabe going to get in each other's faces here. I think Taguchi should really just back the hell away and let him go. Kawato certainly should. Now. And again, he's got the right... Kawato has a good build and has already got some springboard capacity in there, doing some kicks. He could probably do well in Mexico. A lot of their guys go on their excursion to CMLL in Mexico. But he's... Also showing a bit of mat wrestling capacity, so I think he could do well in Europe, too. England. I always like to see guys get a good rounded repertoire of not just moves, but what they can do. Because, I mean, you look at guys like Okada and AJ Styles before he left Omega... Kushida in the junior heavyweight division, Tanahashi, they're very well-rounded. And 
You know, it, it, it's not just that it gives them a bigger move set to draw on and build their matches from. It also means that they can work with more people reliably. Is there are a few things that suck worse and when you're watching pro wrestling than watching a couple of people in a ring together that clearly have not worked together before enough to build up, you know, a way to work with each other and make a match look good and just everything seems to clash and go wrong. You can get that for a lot of reasons. Sometimes uh, people whose styles are too damn similar, you can have that as a problem because then it's like watching a mirror image fighting with itself. But a lot of times it's just because, you know, they don't know how to work with each other. And the more rounded out your skill set is, the easier that it is to work with other people. even if the style you prefer to work in is very different. I think that was one of the things that happened with Fale and Sabre Jr. is uh, <clears throat> they did what they could, but Fale didn't have a well-rounded out enough skill set to go any further with a match, so they just kind of had to finish it the way they did. Although it's also very likely they weren't given a very long match time to begin with. Alright, so on to the next one. We've got Fale, Owens, and Takahashi for Bullet Club. Going to be going up against Ibushi, Oka, and Kitamura. Kitamura is the big jacked up guy Oka is the smaller dude I believe somewhat smaller and bald yet And Ibushi. Actually, those two guys, uh, Oka and Kitamura, I could actually see them doing really well staying in New Japan and forming a tag team. Because if there's anything that New Japan desperately needs right now, it's more tag teams. And I mean that absolutely seriously. I'm not being snarky. I've been saying for a long time that they need to merge the two tag team divisions, especially now that they've lost Rapungi Vice as a tag team. They do not have enough teams to support either division. If they combined them, they would at least have a few dedicated teams that could compete against each other. We've got Fale starting off against Ibushi. This is going to be the next matchup for these two in the tournament. Going to have the smaller high flyer slash kicker in Ibushi going up against Fale. Much bigger smash the crap out of people sort of style, of course. Big man wrestler. Fale trying to big man his way out of Ibushi's kicks, and it's not working. Still able to send the younger, smaller guy flying, though. I think he's younger. Definitely smaller. Could become a matter of attrition between those two. 
Gonna have Kitamura come in. Who's very fired up. And wants to show off his picks. And Takahashi. Playing with him a little bit. Cons him into doing a little bit of showing off of the muscles. Owens comes in and gets him from behind. Shoulder blocks them both down, though. Looking to suplex them both, but they are biting his thumb. Kick, knee. Takahashi catches him. Double backdrop. And I'm not sure what happened to the other two. I think Fale went and got them both off the apron. Takahashi with kicking Kitamura sends him into Owen's boot. Looks like we're going to get some traditional tag team tactics here, and they're going to try to isolate Kitamura. Which is not a bad strategy. Young Lion or not, he's a very strong individual, so he could be perceived as the most dangerous certainly of the two young lions Ibushi certainly of course the most experienced of the three pretty damn well rounded as I was talking about earlier we've seen him uh, do some mat wrestling here and there Although his main uh, repertoire would be consisting of those kicks and high-flying moves. Only a two-count. Been seeing him use a lot of strikes in the tournament so far. A lot more than he usually would, actually. He hasn't been employing the high-risk stuff a lot. But then he has suffered from some injuries in the past, so... It could very well be that he's decided to tone down on the high-risk stuff and stick more to his striking-based offense. Kitamura looking a little wild there, trying to fire off on Owens. Owens, old-school heel tactics being a bit too much for Kitamura, but he gets caught with a flapjack there. Kitamura needs a tag. Can he get to Oka? Who I've decided I'm going to call Okra. Because I'm not sure how I should be pronouncing his name. If only he had a fuzzy hairdo. Nice belly to belly throw suplex there little sloppy but he's still learning and we got the Boston Crab trying to shug off Takahashi's forearms decides to throw one of his own throws Takahashi out you'll see the young lions do the Boston Crab a lot because it's one of the first moves they're taught We'll just ignore that, shall we? It was an invisible lasso. That's what brought him down. A little triple teaming. Running knee. To 
broken up. Not quite a shining wizard. Muto used to get a lot uh, fuller impact. There we go. Bushi coming off with a drop kick. Hits it clean. Lots of impact. Ducks him. Double Pele kick. Calling for a bit of high flying, but Fale catches him. Sends him into the guardrail. Just going to kick him a bit there. So now we got Owens and Okra in the ring. Thrust kick, super kick if you prefer. Gonna go for the package pile driver and hits it. Two and three. Sounds like a, it is pronounced Oka. I'll still call him Okra. Just because it's funny. And Chase Owens. They're going to... I couldn't tell who they were tossing out of the ring. One of the young lions just so they could... push Oka, Okra out of the ring uh, themselves. I don't know. said it before I'll say it again I really don't understand a lot of the the heel crap that the bullet club does because most of the time it really makes no sense and they're not consistent like folly going after the announcer dude I I don't know what brought that on or why he does it he's just supposed to be a big bully I guess but it's Just it really just makes him look like a punk. I don't I don't really understand the point of it. Alrighty then. Alrighty. So now we're going to have... See who's coming out first. It's going to be Naito and Bushi, Los Ingobernables de Japón, going up against Ishii and Gero. Here comes Bushi, rocking another weird-ass outer mask there. Supposed to be a Terminator reptile thing. I don't know. And Naito getting a good pop from the crowd.
And here comes Ishi and Ghetto. Naito's been doing pretty good in the tournament. Three wins, one loss. One loss to Fale. I think Fale picked up that win because he kind of got under Naito's skin. Ishii... Not great, not bad either. Going two and two. Lost to Goto, won against Makabe, lost to Ibushi, beat Yoshihashi. Back when uh, Naito held the world title for a while, these two had one hell of a match against each other, so looking forward to seeing that rematch. Ishii's another one that I think really kind of needs to shake up his game a little bit. But what he does works for him. We'll start off with some hard forearm shots there. Naito wanted to show he can stand toe to toe with Ishii. If you're fairly new to New Japan, then you you know maybe you just started watching for the tournament this year. Maybe you're still getting used to the different style that they tend to work. Ishii very much a strong style wrestler. It's a style pretty much originated in New Japan. It's all about those hard forearm shots and just beating the crap out of each other. A lot of strikes, some suplexes and slams. A real high impact, very much about just beating the crap out of each other to see who gives first. Naito, a bit more of a mixed bag. Likes to play head games. Ibushi, more of a high flyer. You can probably tell that from the mask. Naito, a bit of an interesting history. Oh, we're going to have the handshake. Ibushi knowing to do a little bad boy cheating of his own. Gato. OG cheater. Gonna mess with each other a little bit here. Bushi, I think he, I, I don't know what happened there. I guess he was gonna try to kick Gato and Gato pulled the ref in front of him. Ghetto along with Jado. Been uh, working in wrestling since the 80s. Late 80s. Naito running on the outside goes after Ishii. Was I saying Naito interesting history? Worked as a, as a face, a baby face for quite a while. 
did well, was pretty damn popular. Won the G1 tournament one year, and instead of doing what they normally did and giving the the winner of the tournament the the main event at Wrestle Kingdom, which is their biggest pay-per-view, their biggest show of the year, they had a fan vote, and Naito's match did not win the main event for the vote. So after that, he he kind of got pissed off at the fans for taking that main event uh, away from him and he ow he is twisting Ghetto's beard that's not cool you don't mess with a man's facial hair nice neck breaker there so anyway, he went off to work some more in a CMLL in Mexico. He's going back to the beard. That's just wrong. Ow. That's, uh, he, went, uh, he went back to work in Mexico for a while. Probably feeling like he needed to mix things up a bit in his career because it wasn't going where he wanted it to. Two, Ishii breaks up the count. And he got involved with the Los Ingobernables faction there in CMLL, which means the ungovernables. Ungovernables. Yeah, gover governorable. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. And he he came back to New Japan, started kind of started his own faction. That was the first year that I watched New Japan, 2015, the G1 Climax Tournament. He started coming out. He was wearing the masks and wearing the suit and liked to take his sweet time taking that suit off for the matches. Started playing the head games, doing a little bit more bad boy stuff bit more cheating, playing, like I said, playing all those head games. Thrust kick connects. One, two, only two count. And he was on his own there for a while, then uh, I believe Bushi was the first one to join in. No, it was evil. Evil. I think. I think it was Evil, then Bushi, then Sonata, and then Time Bomb. Naito misses the big flying forearm, gets flipped by Ishii's clothesline. Gato catches the leg, does the pin, tries to, but gets caught. One, two, and three. Bushi picks up the win. Catches Gato off guard. Bushi, I don't know as much about him. I think he might have been a off with an injury or working someplace else for a while. I think he used to work face two, then he came back, joined Los Ingobernables. And uh, they tend to kind of skirt that border between heel face, not necessarily being all out cheaters and heels, but uh, Definitely working the rebellious bad boy angle. Ishii chucking the hat. Not happy with that loss. I don't think Ishii's ever happy with anything.
okay? And I said that they don't usually do outright heal shit. That well, definitely was. I'm not sure what the point of that was. So we've got Goto and Yoshihashi going up against Tanahashi and Finley, David Finley. Um, I have to assume that Goto is going to be going up against Saber in their next match. That's that's going to be their next matchup for the two of them. Uh, and Yoshihashi against Tanahashi. Because Goto went up against Tanahashi last time, lost. So I do not know why Goto wasn't in the match against Saber earlier. I guess they wanted to get the Young Lions a match in so they could get some more experience and didn't have... Uh, a third for Saber and Desperado, perhaps? I don't know what happened there. Why they couldn't have split them up on the match, I don't know. Let's see, so we got three tournament guys in the match here. Goto was doing well to start with. He beat Ishii, he beat Nagata, then lost to Makabe, then lost to Tanahashi, so he's two and two. Tanahashi has done pretty damn well. He started off losing to Saber, but has beat Fale, Nagata, and Goto. So he's got three wins in a row with one loss to start. Not too bad. Yoshihashi, not too good at all. Beat Nagata in his opening match, but has lost to Naito, Zack Sabre Jr., and Ishii. So he's riding a three-loss streak. However, going into his match with Tanahashi, he may have a bit of an advantage because he does like to employ the butterfly lock. And depending on how you torque that move, you can either focus it on the arms or the neck. You get it in tight enough, you hit both. And Tanahashi is suffering an arm injury. going into the tournament with the injury, but he's been uh, fighting through it. And you got David Finley in there who could be used as a runway light. I think.
But he's Irish. If he got in a tanning booth, he'd probably just turn into charcoal. Well, his father's Irish. I have no idea where he grew up. The son of Fit Finlay. I start off with Goto and Finley. Trading headlocks here, side headlocks. Off the ropes, shoulder block takes Finley down. Finley, who appears to have gotten some black dusters and attached them to his boots. Comes off with a flying uh, uppercut. Two count. Which really should have just been a one count. It is a bit of a criticism I have of New Japan. They are a little too fond of all those two counts. It is just right at the start of the match. Hardly anything's happened. Goto should have been able to kick out at one. Ushiyashi sending Tanahashi into the guardrail there. Goto and Finley still in the ring. Goto laying in some kicks. Ushiyashi back up. He's going to come in. Finley. Body slams. Finley there. Gonna go for a. And there we go. There's a one count. See if we're gonna see some traditional tag team wrestling there. Boot to the face. Hashi drives Finley into Goto's boot. Uchihashi going to send Tanahashi to the outside. Goto. Single leg crab. You can see how he's got the leg crossed over so he can put even more torque on the joints. Finley gets to the rope. Tag, Yoshiyashi comes in. They have effectively isolated David Finley at this point. They're going to want to keep that going. David Finley, not that long off of being a young lion himself. Goto keeping both men uh, prone on the ropes. Yoshiyashi shoots in with a kick. Only gets a two count there. These two perhaps could make a good effective tag team. After the tournament, they've worked mostly as singles competitors, although Goto worked sometimes with, as a tag team with Shibata in the past. Finley finally able to get the tag. Tanahashi coming in. He going to clean house. Laying in some strikes on Yoshihashi. Reversal into the corner. Uh, Tanahashi shoots out and hits a flying forearm. And nails Goto. He 
catch of the leg, but Goto disrupts the attempt at the leg whip. Tanahashi likes to use that leg whip. Tanahashi nails Yoshihashi and gets a leg whip off on both of them. Looking to get Yoshihashi. He's probably going to be looking for a front flip senton here. Is he going to be able to hit it? And does. One, two, only two go. Short two go. Looking for the sling blade, but gets caught with a chop. Thrust kick. Yoshiashi catching him, going for look like a suplex, but gets caught with a rolling neck breaker. Tanahashi looking for the tag, gets it. Finley coming in. Little bit flamboyant showboating there. Not a good idea. Gets caught. It gets caught with the... It's kind of a variation on an enziguri. Gonna bring in Goto. Catches Finley looking for the Goto Revolution, but gets stopped. Tanahashi, not sure what he was looking for there, but gets caught by Yoshihashi. And Hashi catches Tanahashi. <laughs> Too many Hashis in this match. Finley has started using a stunner as a finisher. Off the shoulders, Death Valley Driver onto the knee. One. Two, only two count. Now I'm going to look for the Goto Revolution, perhaps. And hits it. It's basically a reverse DDT onto the knee and a three count. saying about Finley using a stunner. Original name of the move is actually the Whippersnapper. It was innovated by Mikey Whipwreck in ECW. Adopted by Steve Austin as the Stone Cold Stunner. I think Finley really needs to work on how he tries to use the move. It's a damn good move, but it, it really needs the boot to set it up or something else to set it up. Tanahashi and Yoshihashi outside jaw jacking. I think that could actually be a very interesting matchup. Sorry about that, I had a bit of a... having a bit of an issue with my playback here. So it might go a bit off sync by a few seconds. Tanahashi has just started walking to the back. He's got the belt, people clapping on him and all that stuff. So you might want to pause and try and get it synced back up. But, uh, so I think uh, Tanahashi and Yoshihashi could be a definite could definitely be an interesting matchup. You've got Tanahashi coming in with three wins in a row, Yoshihashi coming in with three losses in a row. 
So you got all the momentum with Tanahashi, all the desperation with Yoshiashi. Which could definitely make for an interesting situation. Alright, so now we're going to get into the tournament matches. Starting with Juice Robinson and Tamatanga. Looks like Tamatanga's coming out first. It'd be interesting to see how this plays out. Juice Robinson been having some leg troubles. He was having some neck trouble early in the tournament. I don't remember exactly what happened, but somehow his knee started acting up. Had some problems there. Had a match with Suzuki. One of those things that... Pride is one thing, but... Uh, the smart thing to do there would have been to just let himself let him be count, himself be counted out. Just take the loss. You don't need that those two points that damn bad. Because of course Suzuki went right after the legs and tore him up. Tamatanga hasn't shown a lot of technical wrestling. Not saying he can't do it or hasn't shown that he can do it. It's just that he doesn't employ much technical wrestling in his style. But when he went up against Kenny Omega, who Kenny Omega also after a match with Suzuki was having some leg trouble, Tamatanga did go after his legs both in the tag match preceding and their tournament match, so he certainly can employ some uh, technical acumen. We'll have to see if he can use that to take Juice Robinson down. Juice, of course, is not going to want to suffer another loss. So he very well might uh, push himself through the match, try to get that win. But it's one of those situations where you have to ask, even if he can get the win, what is the price he's going to pay to get it? Mistake, I think. Tomatonga actually going to leave him be. Bit surprising. Perhaps he simply feels that he doesn't need any cheap shots. After the match with Suzuki, Juice came out to do a tag team match. He didn't know which leg to limp on, because both of them are pretty jacked up. Of course, uh, if Tomatonga is getting uh, too cocky, that could definitely be in Robinson's favor. As predicted, Tomatonga shoots in, going after the leg. Juice able to avoid it. Interesting uh, situation in that uh, Tomatonga is really all about movement and Juice has seriously limited movement at the moment. Tomatonga showing some technical ability here.
good deep hammer lock. Tomaton able to get out of it. Looking maybe for a hammer lock half Nelson combination. Doesn't get it. Juice able to get up. Fireman's carry takeover with an arm bar. Into an arm bar, I should say. Interesting strategy here. Very good strategy for Juice. Probably knew Tomatongo was going to try to get him on the mat and go after his leg, so he's using that to his advantage, trying to keep Tomatonga grounded, keep him from being able to use that mobility. Very good strategy. Tomatonga go into the hair. Clean break for a moment. Interesting uh, variation on a, so well, basically a stunner, a, a leg stunner. Post the leg on the shoulder, drop down. Definitely going to tweak the knee, possibly the ankle. Don't think I've seen that before. So something else you have to watch out for with Tomatonga. He can be quite unpredictable. Spending way too much time wandering around. He needs to stay on top of Juice here. You have the advantage, you stick to it. Sending him into the other corner, looking for the splash. Hits it. And goes back to wandering around. Juice trying to rub some of the pain out of his leg. Perhaps a bad idea to pull that knee pad down. Hard shots to the gut. Stiff drop kick right there. And Tomatonga back to the showboating and messing around. Gotta look for that splash again. Yes, but gets caught. Juice was a little tenderfooted there, trying to get him up. Got him into a really nice full Nelson slam there. Really good elevation and impact. Looking for... Wasn't sure what he's going to do. Hitting the punches. Some chops. Gets caught. Nice reverse DDT. Only a two count. Interesting variation. Similar to, I believe it was Christian used to do A reverse DDT similar to that, I believe. Nice Cobra clutch. In the seated position, kind of a combination. Camel clutch, Cobra clutch. 
Tamatanga inching his way back, gets to the rope. Juice, I think, could benefit from a new finisher. He's been using the... It's had so many names. The Unprettier being the one I remember the easiest. One of those awkward moves that is extremely easy to get out of. Tamatanga looking for one of his old finishers here. I forget what he called it. It's basically a guillotine with hooks in down into a DDT. Oh, oh, damn. Chop block to the knee and Juice landed on his leg badly. That's double trouble. Tamatanga getting him. Oh, great vine, or no, a tree of woe here. And attacking the knee. Gonna be looking for that splash in the corner onto the leg, I think, and hits it. Serious impact onto the knee and hits it again. Juice finally manages to get his leg free off that impact. Jarred his leg loose. Tamatanga spins him out, nails him. One, two, only a two count. Probably hoping that the pain of the knee would convince Juice to just stay the hell down. Really should go after some sort of leg submission here. So I think sometimes Tomatonga gets himself into a bit of trouble. He likes to showboat a bit too much. He is a little too keen to hit the, the, uh, the gun stun, the cutter. A little bit too uh, dedicated to the moves that he prefers to use. I can understand that you you have a style, you stick to your style, you have a move set that you employ, you want to hit the, your moves. Juice gets him up, maybe looking for a power bomb. Going for the stunner again, the stun again, the cutter that gets thrown off. Juice going for the the face plant. But again, as I said, very easy to get out of. And a kick to the knee. Cutter is blocked yet again. Looking for it. Can he hit it? Nope. Spun around. Hits the old finisher, the DDT. Two, only a two count. But Tomatonga wants to hit that cutter. Could probably have had this in the bag if he would have just locked on a leg submission. And gonna go for it again. Roll up. One. Two, only a two count. Long two count. And he finally hits the cutter. Is he going to get a three, though? Two, three. That was a three count, so yes. It only took him, like, five tries. He needs to watch some old DDP tapes. There's only ever been one guy who really used the cutter to perfection, and it was Diamond Dallas Page. 
If you want to use that move, you want to learn how to use that move properly and look good using it, you watch DDP tapes. Going for the damn thing like five times in such a fast succession like that. Not a great performance there towards the end. And again, about Juice Robinson and using that at the um, prettier or whatever you want to call it. Not a very good move. It's way too easy to get out of. Not very convincing. He needs something new. I'd say the same thing about the Bad Luck Fale and his version of the the whatever edge you want to call it. Insider, outsider, razor. Cross power bomb. Crucifix power bomb, if you prefer. It's another one of those moves way too easy to get out of. Audience giving Juice some love for his uh, determination in the face of suffering. I'd say if he hadn't kept trying to go for the unprettier, he possibly could have hit uh, Tomatonga with something and put him away as well. Up next, we should be having Toriano up against Sonata. Yep. Sonata coming out first. So far, Sonata not done too great. Won against Evil in their opening match, but has lost to Suzuki and Okada. Toriano lost to Okada. They had their opening match against each other. Beat Kojima, but lost to Kenny Omega. So they're both sitting at one and two. Going to be looking to pick up that second win here. Sonata, his match against Okada, hard fought. Wasn't able to get the win, though. He's definitely not going to want to lose to Toriano. Go down three losses in a row. Toriano, hard to say that he ever really takes the tournament all that seriously, so... 
hard to tell if he really cares all that much if he really, you know, if he wins or loses. Very well could be that he mostly enjoys messing things up for the other competitors in the tournament more than anything else. Hard to say. And Sonata is not going to give him a chance at all. He's looking to just finish this. Two, only a two count, almost a three count, I was going to say. Tariana going right to the turnbuckle pad. Sonata catches him and bats him in the butt. Sonata just pouring a whole bottle of water over Toriano's face there. Gets spit at two, only two count. Really just uh, kind of torture-racking Toriano there. Sonata really doesn't want to lose this one. <laughs> uh, Toriano playing his tricks. Sonata Catching him again, throws the tape away. This match against Kenny Omega, Toriano tried uh, winning by taping up Omega's legs. And Omega caught Toriano and taped up his legs too. Then they were bouncing around like a couple of bunnies. Which was quite amusing. Break of the eyes. Double leapfrog and a drop kick. Little signature sonata there. The rib breaker gonna go for the moonsault. Toriano gets out of the way. Sonata goes into the exposed turnbuckles. Toriano sees it coming and ducks the clothesline. Does not see that coming, but hooks him two and only two count. Sonata catches the cold skull. I think is what he calls it. That's what his nickname is. Mariano has another roll of tape. And he's got Sonata. That gets kicked free. Kicked off. Hits him with the slingshot crossbody there. Sonata walking him all the way up the ramp. 
Gonna tape up his legs so he can't know he's gonna do the tie him. Yeah, he's tying him up with a tape too. Possibly looking to hog tie him here. Effectively. And just leaves him there. Coming back to the ring. Gonna be looking to get a count out win. And he gets it. Tariano's bag of tricks backfired. Now you have to wonder how the hell he's going to get free. Uh, two young lions are going to help him. Tariano does not appear to be a happy camper. <laughs> Alrighty, so now we've got Suzuki versus Evil. Evil coming out first. So far, Evil not doing too bad. Lost to Sonata opening match, but beat Juice Robinson and beat Tomatonga. Suzuki lost to Omega in their opening match, also beat, but also went up against Sonata and beat him and has beat Juice as well. So both sitting at two and one. Him both losing their opening matches, but going on a two-win streak here. So they're going to be looking to both be looking to keep the win streak going and keep the points coming. Evil, more of a strong style wrestler, employs a lot more slams and uh, other power moves. Also likes to use the strikes. Suzuki, very much an MMA 
base style. Both have a tendency to get uh, tied to their finisher. Suzuki with a gotch pile driver or a cradle pile driver if you prefer. Evil likes to use a version of a, an STO. Suzuki actually coming out by himself. Nope. El Dorado. Desperado. El Desperado. He's coming out with him. Although they haven't used a lot of interference in the matches so far. Some, but not much. <laughs> so I don't really understand all the interference and crap from the faction, especially in Suzuki's matches. He's built up as this horrible, sadistic badass that'll torture everybody and anybody he gets his hands on to be feared at all times and then has inter guys interfering in his matches so he can win. And, not really surprisingly, they just go right after each other. Suzuki, first to employ a chair, grabbing another, hits him on the back, gets another one, hits him again. Suzuki, Crippler of Chairs. Finally heading back to the ring. Swiping a bottle of water. And... Smacks him in the head with it. While it's a nice visual, I, I don't know why that is supposed to do any damage. It's a plastic bottle with water in it, and the cap's off, so it's just going to crumple. Suzuki wandering around on the outside. Evil getting up. Evil's getting to the ring and he's going to make it back in. Yeah. Suzuki has a pin. 
And he's digging it into Evil's forehead. Evil catches Suzuki, who appeared to be going for a headbutt or something, couldn't quite tell. Catch the foot, big clothesline in the corner, discus clothesline. Suzuki, rough tumble to the outside. Evil catches him. Some shoulder blocks into the guardrail there. El Desperado sent flying. Evil with a chair going after Suzuki, gonna get him the hair over the head, the chair over the head, and then hits it with another one. I was uh, thinking the other day that Evil could work some more chair stuff into his routine his you know his repertoire of moves maybe take some nods from Rob Van Dam and some of the other old school ECW guys not saying he should make it every single move about using chairs or whatever but it's always a truism about any kind of performance based uh, industry I guess that you want to try and stand out especially with something like pro wrestling oh and he's got the thumb and is wrenching on it not a good idea to give Suzuki easy access to something that he can start twisting on got the arm now but uh, anyway uh, evil as far as his in-ring work goes, he's kind of just another strong style dude. He has some style of his own, but I was thinking that since he kind of likes using the chairs now and again, he could work some more chair-based offense into his routine, you know, his repertoire, and give him something a little extra to stand out. Suzuki continuing to attack the hand and arm. Evil likes to employ the ref on occasion. Unwittingly, of course, by sending that leg over. And Red Shoes gets flattened. And now, after I said nice things about them, they're going to use a bunch of interference. Bushi coming out to help. And suicide dive. Sends Desperado into the guardrail roughly. Suzuki. And Tai Chi prop comedian guy is in with a chair. And here comes Time Bomb. Suzuki forgetting that Los Angobernables is quite happy to interfere and cheat when it suits them as well. Los Angobernables dudes taking Tai Chi and Desperado the hell out figuratively and literally but a chair is left in the ring Suzuki has it red shoes recovering slowly very low with that chair shot red shoes catches him takes it away big clothesline connects 
Calling for his finish. He gets caught. Headbutt connects to the chin. Suzuki up. Goes for the sleeper again. He likes to use a sleeper as a setup for the gotch pile driver, that cradle pile driver. And there he goes for it. Goes for it too soon and gets caught. One, two, and three. Evil gets the win. Suzuki going for the pile driver way too soon there. Evil knew it was coming, took advantage. Often seems to be that when Suzuki gets off his game plan, doesn't work a match the way he's capable of working it, he lets the interference happen and all the other crap, that's when he does the worst, it seems like. When Suzuki goes out there and is just Suzuki in the ring, being himself, working his style, it works for him. When he starts with the interference, he loses. seems to be I'd get the hell out of his way though Next, we're going to have Kojima going up against Okada. Okada predictably doing very well. Three wins in a row. Kojima, on the other hand, not done well at all. Three losses in a row. Kojima, one of the older stars of the company, hasn't had any real singles title success for quite some time. One of the ones who's probably uh, heading towards being one of the, you know, he's one of the, gotten to be one of those guys that mostly just works in opening matches these days. But still, in his prime, one of the biggest stars of the company. Okada, current world champion. Definitely the, the big ace of the company right now. So on paper, things are not looking good for Kojima. Having said that, Kojima's got experience on his side. Okada might be feeling a bit cocky.
And Kojima is not going to want to go four losses in a row. So sometimes you talk about intangibles within a pro wrestling match, the things that you can't really just put down to statistics like age and all that stuff. You got to ask the question, can Koji, can Kojima get a win here? on sheer determination and willpower. <laughs> if if Okada takes him too lightly, that could also definitely play in Kojima's favor. Okada working a bit of, of working a bit heel here. Kojima laying in some strikes, misses, eats a forearm, floors Okada with a big shoulder block. And shows off his pecs. Laying in some hard boots there. Clubbing forearm. Okada going straight for the Rainmaker and blocked. Stiff forearm. Kata hits the drop kick to the top, sends Kojima flying. Into the guardrail, Kojima hits pretty hard on his lower back. Kind of booting him over, possibly setting him up for the flying crossbody. No, maybe looking for a draped DDT and hits it. Kata getting a little rough with Tenzon. Red Shoes sending him out. Kata just about squaring up to both of the older guys here maybe trying to say that I could take both of you on at the same time and it wouldn't make a difference seems kind of the tone I'm catching from this whole thing interesting to see Okada working a bit of a heel angle here for this match Gonna hit the drop kick and hits it. The 
Only a two count. Crowd seems to be pretty firmly behind Kojima. From what I can hear. He's trying to fight back. Okada. They said the cockiness might cost him, but at the moment he does not seem to have anything to worry about. Face lock. Breaks it, gets some kicks in, but gets stopped. Hard European uppercut. Red Shoes refusing to count. Okada really just kind of showing disdain for his elders here. You know, when I talk about him being uh, maybe more of the opening card match guys these days, I do not mean that in a disrespectful way. Just their time on top is kind of over. They've had their day. They, they aren't ready to retire yet that doesn't mean you treat him like crap <laughs> Kojima firing back with some Mongolian chops hits him but Okada stops him cold again this is the usually launches in with a back elbows splash smash sort of thing missed Kojima nails him hits him again miss on the clothesline but successfully takes him down again Looking for the lightning chops, and he's going to get it. And takes a stiff forearm from Okada there. Takes one back from Kojima. And another big chop, and another. And he's going to do it again. Into the corner. Misses the flying forearm. Takes the back elbow. Okada was looking for the DDT. Gets caught. Takes one. Kojima definitely having some stamina issues. Might be a good time if he can get Okada down on the mat. Maybe mat wrestle him a little bit. Slow things down. Let himself catch his breath. He might be in a bit of, bit of a better position, but he's still trying to go smash mouth with Okada. Gets caught. Uh, it's a kryptonite crunch onto the knee, essentially. Okada going to look for the big elbow drop. And hits it. 
Got a call for the Rainmaker. Wide angle shot. Yep. Kojima trying to answer and backs Okada up. Stops the Rainmaker. Nasty elbows there. Laying in some shots. Okada trying to fight off Kojima. But takes a big clothesline. Okada, the, his turn to go tumbling all the way to the outside. Looked like he might have nailed his head on the turn or the guardrail there. Kojima taking a little R and R. Kind of barely getting back in the ring. Took a really nasty tumble there. Managing to stay out of the suplex over the top. Hitting Kojima with some boots. Misses the third, but nails Kojima anyway. Oh, Kojima gets him with another stiff forearm there. But not really able to capitalize. Hits him again. I think his age is really catching up to him now. He's not really able to answer. He can't capitalize. He's finally, he's getting back up. But can he get that essential move in that will take Okada down, take him off his game plan? That spill to the outside seemed to have taken a lot out of Okada. This is, that was the opportunity Kojima desperately needed, but can he take advantage? I'm gonna go back to the lightning chops. He likes to follow it up, and he hits it with a forearm, sends him tumbling. He, I think he likes to follow this up with an elbow drop, but he's really sl moving slow here. I don't know Kata catches him. Not sure what Okada's looking for here. Kojima fighting him off. Gets free. Now setting Okada up for something. Maybe looking for the cutter from the top and hits it. Is that going to be enough? One, two, only a two count. The Koji Cutter. Maybe looking for a Brain Buster. Ooh! Perfectly executed Brain Buster. Is that going to be enough? One, two, only a two count. Kojima actually has Okada hurt. He's going to go for the clothesline. If he can nail this, he might get it. 
Gets caught. German suplex holds on. Gonna look for the rainmaker. Ducked. Clothesline to the back of the head. Okada definitely felt that. Kojima floors Okada coming in off the Rainmaker. Only a two count. Kojima's got to get up. He's got to stay on top of Okada. He's got to land something. He actually has him shaking here. He could potentially get a three count. He could potentially pick up that all-important first win. And if he can beat Okada here, he'd almost certainly get a title shot. Misses the clothesline again and again. Okada hits that damn drop kick. And going to look for the, the Rainmaker again. Misses it. Discus forearm catches Okada flush in the chest. Kojima. I'm not sure what he was looking for there. Maybe a Fire Thunder driver, but gets caught with the, the tombstone. Is he going to get hit? And takes the Rainmaker. One, two, and it's over. Three. Okada goes up 4-0. Kojima goes down Alrighty then, coming up next, I believe we have our main event, which will be Kenny Omega going up against Michael Elgin. Believe uh, these two. I missed the first day of the special here in the States, but I think these two did go up against each other in that tournament. Maybe they didn't, I'm not sure. I know the last time I saw them go up against each other was the ladder match for the Intercontinental title. I believe that's the last time they faced each other. And in that match, Michael Elgin came out on top. These two had a bit of a rivalry going on there for a while, and... They always uh, beat the crap out of each other. So, be interesting to see a return to that feud. Michael Elgin not had a great tournament so far 
lost to Tomatonga, lost to Okada, beat Kojima in their third uh, round match. Omega, on the other hand, has had three wins in a row. So, Omega will definitely be looking to make that four in a row so he can keep pace with Okada. No doubt that's how he's looking at it. It's not just about the points. He doesn't want to, you know, being in the same block as Okada this year, he's going to want to try to match him win for win. He's going to want to outdo him. Elgin looking to pick up that second win. These two really don't seem to like each other very much, so I'm sure giving uh, Omega his first loss of the tournament would be a feather in Elgin's cap. And a win would be the title shot at that U.S. heavyweight title there recently introduced Omega winning the tournament to crown the first champ have to say I'm not sure what the rationale for introducing the title was since they've already got uh, the heavyweight championship the intercontinental heavyweight championship and the never open weight championship that only ever seems to get contested by heavyweights The never open weight championship more or less becoming the strong style championship currently held by Suzuki intercontinental title held by Tanahashi and world champ Okada so introducing a fourth singles title it's essentially another uh, heavyweight well it is a heavyweight title essentially the fourth heavyweight title since uh, I haven't seen any junior heavyweights go after the open weight title. Said I'm not really sure what the rationale behind that was. When they already have more championships than they can really afford to put on cards. Omega wiping sweat off on red shoes. Sure. Trying to out muscle Elgin, not gonna happen. Elgin sends Omega into the corner hard, but he's a boot. Picks him up, carries him back into the corner. Stiff chop. Sends Omega flying. Uh, look to suplex Omega. Make him think about it. One of the best stalled suplexes I've ever seen. Although there are others who have done a really good one as well. Like Elgin was looking for the slingshot splash. Omega knew it was coming. Stopped him. Hits him with a high kick. Elgin shoots over with a nice shoulder block. Actually spun out there to hit it. Sends Omega flying off into the guardrail. I said in one of my other, my first commentary that I thought Elgin could use a bit of a change up in his move set. Looks like he might be trying to bring something new, make himself a little less predictable. Getting Omega up, trying to suplex him again, 
Omega Wiggles free. Tries to springboard off the guardrail but gets caught. Elgin sends it flying with an overhead belly to belly. On to those thin mats. Elgin sending Omega back to the inside. Going up top. Don't see Elgin fly much. Not from the top turnbuckle. Gets caught. While it can be good to be to go outside your comfort zone to be a bit more unpredictable. Don't want to go too far out. That can cost you. Elgin fighting Omega off. Maybe he's looking for a sunset bomb there. Omega hanging on for dear life. Elgin trying to get him with a power bomb. Omega wiggles free, gets free, hits a super kick. Up and over with the face buster. Or a bulldog, if you prefer. Two, only two count. Having a bit of a glitch here. Omega shooting in with some knees, hard knees to the ribs. One, 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 one. Couldn't tell if that was a one or a two count. Swings around, gets him in a chin lock. Raking at the eyes a little bit there. Elgin trying to fight Omega off. So a couple of hard body shots. Takes a chop there. Omega's not going to be able to out-muscle Elgin. He might be able to outstrike him, though. He is the faster of the two. And they say whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Okada and Omega have had some absolute wars. Omega's had some real wars with other guys as well, including Elgin. Gets out of the way of the splash yet again. Omega is showing the, just how tough he is. He just seems to keep getting tougher. Again, they'll get up looking for the rollover there and hits it. Snaps up. Moon salt, but misses. Elgin knew it was coming. Maybe looking for a deadlift German or belly to back. Omega fighting. Gets free. Runs chest first into the turnbuckle and takes a clothesline to the back. Nasty, nasty elbow there. Hard chop.
Not sure what Omega was looking for there. Maybe a close line, but he got caught with that power slam. Hard chop from Elgin. And another. Blocking his strikes. Omega takes a really nasty forearm and a release belly to back suplex. Sends him flying. Huge clothesline. Looking for another. And another. In the past, Omega has had some trouble dealing with Michael Elgin's power. And he's having the same trouble here, it looks like. Omega just running Elgin into the corner. Clubbing blow was enough to send my, uh, Michael Elgin off and away. What's Omega looking for here? He's looking for a crossbody, but got caught. Sort of a tilt-a-whirl slam. Only a two count. Off the shoulder, swung him around into a side slam. I'm not sure what that's called. If it has a name, I'm sure it does. Knowing the way pro wrestling is, it probably has a half a dozen names. I just don't know any of them. Elgin hitting with a clubbing blows. Clotheslines, really. Likes to go back and forth, chest back. Gonna call for a big running clothesline here. Omega looking to hit the Snapdragon, but takes an Enziguri. Now Elgin calling for the clothesline again, but gets caught with a Hurricane Rana. Or a Head Scissors takedown, or a Frankensteiner. Take your pick. Omega, I think he was going for the over-the-top move with a flip. Counters to the counters, hits the snap dragon. Elgin goes to the outside. Omega going to be looking for the flipping dive. Hits it. Doesn't quite land on his feet. Manages to avoid taking any nasty tumbles, though. You have to keep in mind that these uh, tournament matches have a time limit of 30 minutes, so... While unlikely, it is entirely possible that these two could fight to a draw. Omega is not going to want to lose the momentum. He's going to want to pick up that fourth win. Elgin is not going to want to drop another loss. 
And nice camera work letting us see that Elgin was waiting for it. Only to go. Drop kick to the back of the head. Nice move. Bad camera angle. Omega calling for the V trigger, that knee he likes to use. Elgin knew it was coming, lands the kick. Miss again, Elgin shooting him with some forearms, alternating. Omega hits the knee, catching him, looking for that leg, and onto the knee. Now he's going to look for the knee. Hits it. He generally likes to use that as a setup for the one wing angel, but Elgin powered through and twisted Omega around with a huge clothesline there. Definitely a desperation move. Elgin has got to follow up. Omega suffering. This is the point where both men are going to have to dig deep to try and pull out that last move to finish the match. Omega has proven several times now that he is more than capable of doing that. Elgin, coming back from an injury a few months ago, has not had the best success rate since coming back. Is he going to be able to pull out the big move to get the win? Trading forearms. Who is going to give in first? Huge backhand slap. I believe Elgin calls that the backhand from the future. Not 100% sure. Maybe looking for the buckle bomb turning the uh, uh, Powerbomb combo that he likes to finish with. Huge clothesline. Is that going to be it? Two count only. This would be a good point in a match for Elgin to pull something new out of his ass. Looking for the buckle bomb. Hits it. Looking for the twisting bomb. Omega knows it's coming and manages to avoid it. Looking for the one winged angel. And there you go. Elgin hits a reverse Hurricane Rana and another huge clothesline. Power bomb. As him up. Crucifix. Power bomb. One, two, and. Oh, only a two count. This is where that resiliency I was talking about with Omega really comes into play. He's had to survive some absolutely brutal wars against the top guys in New Japan the last few months. And it's certainly toughened him up.
Hits the flying knee there on the apron. Peels back the mats. Not sure what he's looking for here. This could bite him in the ass. Gonna try to put Elgin on the floor. It gets caught. Apron bomb. Huge impact. I think Omega was looking for a Hurricane Rana onto the floor there. Paid for it. Omega definitely looking out of sorts. Elgin putting him up on the top turnbuckle. Looked like he was going to attempt that crucifix bomb from the top, but got hit in a Hurricane Rana. Only a two count. Hits the knee to the back of the head that time. Got to look for it from the front. Hits it. One, two, only two count. Looking. Double underhook pile driver. Two, only a two count. Elgin refusing to stay down. eating some really nasty punishment here some really nasty moves taking a lot of punishment mixing phrases there Omega gonna look for the one wing angel this hits a straight knee to the face and again Doesn't really have a lot of force behind those, though. Elgin catches the leg. Huge forearm. It gets nailed with another knee. And another one. Reverse Hurricane Rana from Omega. One, two, and only two count. I asked if Elgin could muscle through, if he could show that toughness. He's doing it. Elgin catches him with a power bomb. Another buckle bomb. Gonna look for the turning power bomb. Hits it. One. Two. Oh, Omega kicks out. Once again, Kenny Omega showing that he's practically willing to let himself be killed to avoid losing the match. And that was Elgin's big finish. What else can he throw at Omega to put him away?
Maybe looking for the Falcon Zero from the top. You have to think that everything Omega had left, he threw into getting out of that power bomb. But now Elgin is giving him a bit of a chance to recuperate a bit. Maybe looking for a burning hammer. If he hits this, there's no way Omega's kicking out. But Omega is fighting. He's fighting free. Really hard impact there. Belly to back side suplex. Variation. And again. One, two, and Omega kicks out again. Burning hammer right on his face. One, two, three. And Omega drops a loss, so Elgin picks up a second win. Elgin had to throw everything he had at him, but he was able to pick up the win there. And you have to ask the question now, when it comes to Kenny Omega, how much extra damage did he endure in that match? What nagging injuries have been inflamed and aggravated? What new injuries might he have now? I would say if he doesn't have bruised ribs or some or something with a bad bruise after that buckle bomb, that I, I'd be very surprised. And I'll leave you with that and let Michael Elgin have his say.